in the world of technology today, there are so many different ways that you can access the scripture, both digitally and through the good old paperback, hardback, leather bound. And so today we're going to talk about how important is it to stay paperback or is it okay to go with a digital Bible? Second Kings chapter 2 and verse number 9 reads like this. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Welcome to Double Portion Podcast. I owe my life to you in every way. For you have paid the price for me. Welcome back, everyone. We're excited to be back with you. And uh, there's a lot of good things to say tonight. Most importantly is that we finally have a merch drop. Hey, I didn't get a hat. <laughs> Your hat's in the in my office. Oh, man, I want a hat. It's waiting for you. As you can see, we got hats. We got hoodies. We actually have two colors of hats. Brother Jordan, wave your hat up here so everybody can see your color. Our robot's throwing his hat. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> That's a nice looking hat. Yeah, it is. We're excited about them. <coughs> and uh, if you're not watching on YouTube, go jump on the Instagram. You'll see pictures of these hats and the hoodies here within, well, as when this comes out, there will be some pictures coming along the way. God bless our technology. Um, and then... I, I did How much the, are the hats and the hoodies? Oh, the hats, $25. Hoodies are 30, 35 Which, when you go look at everything else on the market right now, they're not going to look as good for sure. And then you're not going to get this kind of quality for that kind of a price. I like that hoodie, too. Yeah. I love hoodies. I just look like a Goodyear blimp. In a <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You got to represent. They need to, uh, they need to sponsor me. You got to represent. And then I wanted to, I wanted to read some comments from Instagram. We've been getting a lot of feedback, Bishop, from the holiness podcast the last few weeks that we did the holiness series we got a lot of feedback i was reading through these the other night so let's go and read a couple here um here we go um brother we had brother austin burke wanted us to uh, send him some uh, some of the resources, so we need to shoot that out to them. Mitch, do you have that on PDF file? We'll have to make a PDF. Well, we'll do our best to do that to, for Brother Austin Burke. And then Sister Miranda from our church in Greeley loved having Melody on, and she said we got to get her back, and I agree with her. Yeah, we do. Having Sister Melody on the podcast was incredible. Um, that was a a good change of pace. And We'd have her on tonight, but she is on her way to the North Little Rock camp meeting. She's singing Sunday morning. So her and mom are traveling tonight. She's a world traveling singer. Yes. Now. When I grow up, I want to sing like her. Yes. You take me into the fire. <laughs> hey, she rocked hey. that song, buddy. <laughs> Moving on to our conversation tonight. <laughs> Let's let her sing that song. <laughs> if you haven't, if you haven't checked that out, you need to go check. Yeah, that out she did an iTunes. awesome job on that song. Way that I take. Shout out to Kirk and uh, who's the other gentleman, brother? Uh, uh, David Hell. No, the other guy that wrote that. Dear Lord, his dad's a friend of mine. Oh, I don't know who wrote. That. Um, Close friend. Daryl. Oh my word! I need a donut. My if you brain. helped write that song, please put it in the comments so we don't. Ryan, who you are. brother Ryan, I know that's his first name. <laughs> Good grief! Anyway, forgive me 
for not remembering your name, brother. Yes. We're not we're not running for office here. <laughs> oh Lord. We need to do these podcasts earlier in the day. Okay. So jumping into our podcast tonight. Uh, we Johns, were... Ryan Johns. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> Sorry, Brother Johns, Brother <laughs> Daryl John, Pastor Daryl John, yeah. dear friend. Incredible. I haven't seen him in many years, but he's a great man of God. Incredible song. Well, after all that randomness, we're going to jump into our <laughs> podcast tonight. Uh, That's funny. So, uh, Bishop, as we know, uh, for many, many years, uh, many of us have been stuck to a paper Bible, and uh, we love the Word of God. I personally love the turning of pages. When I buy books, I like to buy paperback copies. Um, but Brother Mitchell and I were actually with a man of God, and and he's an evangelist, he travels a lot, and he said, man, I would love to do that, but I'm an evangelist. I don't really have a lot of room for, for this. So he said, well, I buy the digital copies, which... Obviously, that's understandable. And uh, there's a lot of questions, a lot of things in the apostolic world that are negative against digital Bibles, digital uh, commentaries, all of that stuff. And so we want to kind of go into the history of the scriptures and the preservation of the scriptures and, and kind of bring us to where we are here in the 21st century. So we're going to turn it over to you tonight. Well, thank you, Brother Jeffrey and Brother Mitchell and Brother Jordan Pound. Uh, so happy to be back with all of our Double Portion Podcast family, nation. So glad that you take the time to learn with us. This is all a learn. It's still a learning project for me. I love learning. And I hope I continue to love learning. Um, I do love the Word of God. I had my first Bible. I learned to read when I was four. And my grandmother gave me a picture Bible. It's so cool. I still have that picture Bible somewhere. I think it's at the house. And in that picture Bible, it actually quotes Acts 2.38 as the method of salvation, which is amazing. It's an old, old Bible that my grandma elder gave me. And when I was a child, I would sit and read that Bible by the hours. And we moved into a new era of technology. A funny story, I went to preach for a man a few years ago, and I arrived on that Sunday morning with my wife. And I wasn't thinking, and I had my iPad with me because I carry all of my notes and stuff on iPad. It's a lot easier than carrying 30 years of notes. I actually, you can ask these boys right around the corner. Here's my library. I have volumes of notebooks that have my paper notes from preaching in them, but I can carry all of that on my iPad. So unthinkingly, I just took my iPad to preach for this man. And when I uh, got there into his office, he said, where's your Bible? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, do you have a Bible? And I said, well, I have 56 of them right here on this iPad. Which one do you want me to use? And uh, he thought I was being smart, Ellie, and I really wasn't. And then it hit me that he uh, was very disappointed that I didn't have a paper Bible with me. So <clears throat> I'm being the sport that I am. I said, well, look, brother, look, just let me borrow one of your Bibles. Well, he didn't. Oh my. So uh, I guess he just wanted to make a deal out of it. Excuse me there, folks. I don't have my chair. I'm, my chair is in being repaired and the, and the hydraulics on this chair keep leaking. So I keep getting smaller and smaller here. <laughs> But uh, that's a funny story. Afterwards, he put a sign on his pulpit that told people that they were not to carry a iPad to his pulpit. 
So if I ever preach there again, I will take a leather-bound Bible. I'm not out to offend anybody, but it is a different era. And uh, part of that is really good uh, because we have access to the Word of God more so today than we ever have before that I'm aware of in the history of humanity. Uh, there are many cultures, even today, that are not literate cultures. There are languages that are not literate languages. They are what are known as illiterate languages. That just means that they have speech, but they do not have a written form. Many of them do not even have alphabets to their language. It was just assumed and developed in that tribe or in that culture. Uh, thank God the English language is a, a uh, literate language. It's a very advanced language. Uh, and it's, I'm, I'm so glad that I do speak the language of English. I, I, I dabble in Spanish and I dabble in Hebrew and Greek, but my main language is uh, English. The, the story of the English Bible is a fascinating story. The first man that translated the Bible, I believe if I remember my history right, it was he translated it from the Vulgate, which was the Latin Bible, which was very popular back in the Dark Ages. Uh, and his uh, name was Tyndale, William Tyndale. He did a fabulous job of translating the Bible. In fact, from some of the sources that I have read, uh, the Tyndale Bible, even though William Tyndale was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English, uh, his Bible was one of the main influencing factor of the King James Bible, which was written in 1611, which we recognize today as the first English translated Bible in the world, as the King James Bible. It was not, but that's the one that we recognize as the first one. It was officially uh, sanctioned by the King of England. So that's the one that we recognize. It is a good Bible. I love the King James Bible. We're not talking about the different versions and translations. We do need to do one, a whole series on uh, that. And my preference and our standard here in the church is a King James Bible. But in those days, there were many people that were not literate. They were. They did not read. And, and so religious entities love that because that's what threw the the world into the dark ages was the illiteracy and anytime there's ignorance and illiteracy uh, there is demons prey on ignorance and illiteracy uh, illiteracy comes from the fact that people do not take the time to think and develop critical thinking which reading plays a major role in that uh formation in one's life that that the formative and information of, of one's life so uh when this happened uh it just threw the world into chaos and ignorance reigned superstition reigned all kinds of wild stories about demons and dragons and and witches and warlords and and warlocks. there was warlocks warlords too yeah uh and there was tremendous amounts of violence against humanity and and uncleanness and so uh one of the greatest things that happened to Humanity was the printing press when Gutenberg uh, developed the printing print, but the printing press uh, that probably was as revolutionary as the computer being developed in the and the uh, World Wide Web. 
Gutenberg's printing press. It made it easier. Up until then, they would copy the Bible by hand. Yeah. And it, so I've seen when one of my favorite uh, uh, displays of this was a, 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 a display in Colorado Springs for many years, three, three, three to five years. A uh, uh, gentleman's name is Green. He owns Murdoch's and Hobby Lobby, Keith Green. Uh, and his his passion is to collect all of the Bibles of the world. I think he has a Gutenberg Bible or portions of one. I've seen the Gutenberg Bible. There's actually a Gutenberg Bible at the Library of Congress, that, and uh, I've seen it right as you walk in. It's right there, and uh, very expensive. Um, but um, up until Gutenberg, it was very expensive to own a Bible. It was against the law in in most cases. If you were caught with a Bible, you could be put to death. It was a capital offense. It was the elite. Only the priest had the ability to read the Bible and translate the Bible. And that's what caused the ignorance in our world. And so um, it's amazing that right at the time that you guys can break in anytime you want to. Right at the time that Gutenberg created the printing press and printed, the first thing that he printed on the press was his Bible, the Gutenberg Bible. That was during the time when Martin Luther was breaking away from the Catholic Church because of the inconsistencies and the, the perverted corruption of the Catholic Church. They had exited so far away from Scripture that the things that they were doing were in, in blatant, open violation of Scripture. And Martin Luther saw this. They were selling uh, condolen or you know, dull indulgences. They were selling indulgences. They were there was just uh, all kinds of perversion going on. That they they were killing one another. Uh, there were actually priests that would go to war with priests to advance their political position, kind of like a lot of organizations I know today. And uh, um, only they don't kill them literally now, but they did back then. They killed them literally. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there were wars between rival bishops to ascend to the papacy. There's blatant deception about the pope. Like they have popes clear back to the second century, which is a big fat lie. There yeah. were no popes in the second century, but they'll tell you they were. Right. Uh, there were there wasn't even a really an organized Catholic Church till after the Council of Nicaea, and it wasn't called the Catholic Church then; it was just called the Church. <clears throat> so, um, when Gutenberg printed the Bible on this print press, it was it was massive. Remember, he's from Germany, and and Martin Luther is driven out of the Catholic Church. They are going to hold him. And contempt of the church and the catholic church had so much power we'll come back and do a whole series on history yeah i'd love to get brother booker back then he is he is a wizard oh, yeah. on on church history and i love church history uh but um when they drove him away they intended to kill him and what saved martin luther's life was gutenberg's printing press Gutenberg was able to print like is either three or six hundred thousand copies of his ninety was it ninety five theses. theses against the Catholic Church, and he was able to disperse those. He had a beneficiary. What was the gentleman's name there in Germany? One of the kings of one of the city states there. I'll think of his name here eventually. That. Uh, helped uh, Martin Luther as well and gave him sanctuary. And so the Catholic Church could not kill him because of the power of the people. So they disfellowshipped him and he started the, the movement known as the Protestant movement. 
out of that pro it means they protested the Catholic Church. Right. Out of that came the the uh, Lutherans, eventually later on the Anglicans, Methodists, and then you get into the uh, then you get into this the the Second Reformation where you have the Anabaptists that come along, which go even further than Luther. They they totally forsook the Catholic ways. Luther didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. He just wanted to reform the Catholic Church. So Gutenberg's Bible played a major role, the printing press. From this, they were able to start printing the Bible, and it wasn't just on scrolls. But it was still extremely hard to get a Bible. And so you had you still had a lot of ignorance. The 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 more that they developed the printing press, the more that they were able to improve the ability to get Bibles and books into the hands of people. And this was known as the era of enlightenment. And the Bible played a major role in that. The Bible played a major role in the whole Western world and the, and the enlightenment of the Western world. And the Bible played a massive role in the development of the nation of the United States. So, Bishop, um, a couple of things that I, I noticed as you're talking, and I wanted you to kind of get through all that before I break in, but the one thing is you at the very beginning of, of, of our history lesson tonight, you said that people did not have the ability to think critically and I know in 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 past times critical thinking especially for young people in some aspects has been looked looked down upon especially right now yeah Be because of the woke movement yeah we're going back in the dark ages right now that same peer pressure against people to think in opposition to the trending thoughts right is what caused the dark ages and and i heard i actually heard brother walker talk a little bit about this talking about the problem now is not that there's not information the problem now is there's so much information and and we we know all the ins and outs of misinformation yeah. and those are big buzzwords we're not talking about all of that tonight. We're really talking about the Word of God. But as um, as young people talk about the importance of young people learning how to think critically, and I say that not I mean not to you know be critical, but think. Yeah. For themselves. And, and well, I think there's a the difference between critical thinking and criticism. Yeah. There's a world of difference yeah. between critical thinking and criticism. So, as a young person, when you have questions, it's important how to know how to approach people. Because I've, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people ask questions, but it's not asked in the right spirit. You know what I'm saying? And it's not, you know, but I think there has to be a general desire for truth. And talk about that, Bishop. Well, that is an extremely deep and fundamental point that you're bringing out, Brother Jeffrey, because in the days of Noah, you got to get this. All of you young people got to get this. In the days of Noah, they became so consumed with themselves that God looked at humanity and he repented that he had made humanity. And he said, my spirit will not always strive with man. A lot of our ability to think, it's your choice, young men and young lady. It's my choice to in form myself 
It's not only your choice, it's your responsibility. Yeah. And you can choose whatever you want to choose to inform or to put yourself in form however you want to do it. If you want to fill your life full of trash, you can do it, especially now with your iPhone. Yeah. You can hide away in the secrets of your bedroom or in a park, wherever, and fill your life full of trash. Fill your mind full of trash. Just let the whole formation of your life be full of darkness. Or you can use that same tool to become one of the greatest lights in the world. And, and here's what the Bible says. Through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth in all wisdom. So, uh, and I know this is, are we going to use books or technology? But to me, it's the same thing. Yeah, of course. It's, to me, what's the difference between a halogen headlight or a, or a uh, LED headlight? They're still lighting. They're, it's still lighting. You're just using different technology, and the LED may be better, more economical, clearer, give you a clearer image. Still, you're after the same. Uh, you're after the same purpose or goal. Yeah. And so, it all depends on your pursuit, young man or young lady. Your pursuit will determine how you form. Are you put yourself in formation? Yeah. So when I was a young man, I didn't have the, the luxury of computers. I remember the first computer that I ever saw was in my father-in-law, my mother-in-law's house. My mother-in-law was a, she still is an author and she is an editor. Many, many years she was editor-in-chief for the children's division of, of the Word of Flame publishing of the United Pentecostal Church, Barbara Westberg. Love her and Papa Westberg very dearly. And uh, so the first computer that I saw, she had an Apple IIe. Some of you don't even know what that is because you weren't even born when an Apple IIe came out. It had a green screen, had two five and a half inch floppy disk you may have had six megabytes of memory and buddy that was a whopping memory a megabyte i'm telling you that that was just incredible and we were so delighted because they got a new computer and they gave us that apple IIe, and that's when my wife started the books of this church on that apple IIe. And then Apple went the way of a dinosaur. You didn't hear about it for years. Microsoft took over the world. So we got a PC. And just in the last few years, Bill Gates has done a great job of uh, copying everybody else's material and, and, and selling it as his. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a funny joke. Just joking, Bill Gates. It's not a joke, but it is a joke. And uh, so problem. now they're popular again. And so, uh, and that's cool. I have, I have all Apple. I'm, I'm looking at an iPad right now and I got an iPhone here and I got a MacBook Pro. And so I, I'm, I don't care. I'm not, you know, whether you're Android or Apple, that's like Ford or Chevy. I don't, it don't matter to me. They both work. Yeah. Uh, so. Just Apple works better. I didn't have the luxury when I was learning these truths of the Word of God. I would go down in the basement of the library of Hutchinson, Kansas, and I would have books spread from here to yonder yeah. over all these tables. And the running down the information was exhaustive because you didn't have a PDF file that would automatically, uh, what, what do they call it, when it index it. The indexing is so fast on a computer. Well, I didn't have that indexing. 
in learning to use in concordance and and strong whoever you are thank you for your inexhaustible time and labor to index the scripture like strong's concordance oh yeah and some of the you know when kids just pick that book up until you spend time in the bible somebody that was a labor of love thank you so much strong's concordance and and some some of the linear bibles that were written back then that would have the various translations and i still have some of those in my library where now with just the flip of a finger i can go through hundreds of translations yeah back then it was a book that you dug it out and i hand wrote it out and then i my first sermon notes and i have a few of them i keep them were typed out on an electric typewriter i could back in the day i could type 80 words a minute right now i've really gotten better i can type 300 words a minute you can't read what i'm typing but i can type (laughs) 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 I, i did get quite proficient when I did my master's degree, but uh, I, I learned to type in high school and was good at it. And some of my first sermons were on a typewriter, Yeah, writing it out by hand and then typing it. And I encourage young ministers do that because that's where I learned so much of the scripture by writing it out. It, it transferred it to my brain. I literally wrote those scriptures out by hand. And so uh, when my first electronic Bible was quick verse and I was a massive fan and some funny stories. I don't know if uh, brother pastor Reagan listens to these podcasts, pastor, uh, Reagan, he pastors in Kansas city. Uh, he pastored in Canyon city at that time. And I was just learning how to use a computer and, and he is a techno whiz. And uh, so he was teaching me how, and I had a PC back then, and uh, I would spend Saturday and Sunday typing out all these messages and hit the wrong button back then and and just erase the whole thing and call him on Sunday afternoon in a panic. How do I get this back? Some of them I got back, some of them I didn't, you know, just the learning curve of of using technology, but I loved QuickVerse. I used QuickVerse for years. And then somebody talked me into a PC Bible, and then there's another eSword, became very popular. Um, some of the programs that I used teaching online at a graduate level, can't think of all of them, but there are a myriad of, of various Bible programs today that are phenomenal, and there's no excuse today for somebody not to know the word of God if they have yeah. a desire because there's just it's too easy to get to the Bible. I have one that's called Bible.is that I listen to every day and it has various Bibles audio and uh, and they're dramatized. And then I have another one uh, that Kirk Franklin put together and you can buy it on iBooks. Let me let me look it up here. I listen to it. It's dramatized and it's very good. Um, if I can find it here, uh, Bishop, while you're looking for that, uh, you know, you talked about very briefly the the idea that at that time people uh, in the Dark Ages at that time people were not able to read the scripture and and we know from history that literally the bible was chained to the pulpit it was yeah literally chained to the pulpit and i haven't heard you say it in a long time but uh i can remember as a little kid growing up on wednesday night we called it the word in action we still do and bishop would really break down and a lot of times take the scripture verse by verse and break down what the word of God was saying and he would encourage everyone where's your Bible he said and this was even before I mean when I was you know I'm I know a lot of you can't believe this but when I was little we didn't even have a projector in our church 
And yeah, we uh, did. We had the one that you put the paper on yeah. it and it shines on the wall. Yeah, we did. <clears throat> That's the only projector we had. For songs. Yeah. And uh, he, Bishop would say, where's your Bible? And, you know, some people like the deer in the headlights look. He'd say, I could be lying to you right now. And you wouldn't even know it. And I think, Bishop, in in a, in an age like this, it's easy to take for granted whatever somebody says over the pulpit is is the way it is. And in, and in all reality, that is you chaining the Bible to the pulpit and say, well, you know, I just, I, I mean, I, I, I'm thankful that I have a pastor that I can trust. But at the same time, I think it's important that young people, whether it be paper or digital or whatever, you get in the Word of God and see, make sure that what your pastor's saying is right. I think so. That that program is called the Bible Experience, New Testament and Old Testament. It's very, very, it's a very, very good, dramatized. It's not the King James. I think it's the ESV version, uh, the English Standard Version, I believe. This one. Mitchell's got a look in his eye. He wants to say something. You know, what you were talking about, Jeffrey, I go back, way back, when I was a little boy, on on Wednesday night, <clears throat> it was Bible study night. Yeah. You came to church, you sang, you had prayer for the sick, you sang one or two songs, you sit down and open your Bibles, and everybody brought a Bible and a notebook. And you could see those saints of God, they would write notes and they would go home and they would study that. And everybody knew the word of the Lord. Today, church has been reprogrammed to where it's more entertainment. And the messages that you hear are more sensational. They're not the expository teaching and preaching that to me is probably the most powerful way to really get the word of God into people's lives is expository teaching and preaching scripture by scripture. And uh, I probably will go back to doing that here pretty soon. I le- that's my favorite way you can learn so much of the word of the Lord is expository preaching and teaching. Um, you do have the inspirational preaching and teaching, which is the rhema word, the right now word of God, which is important. But... Uh, the Bible says that they continued steadfast, steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Oh. So there is the there is the the systematic uh, transfer of the word of God from generation to generation. And if we don't do that, we lose it. Yeah, pardon me, this crazy. <clears throat> I think part of why people just say, well, I'm just going to trust what the preacher says now, honestly, is because technology is so prevalent. Because for me, and this is just my preference, but for me, when I do research on a computer, I'm trying to find information. When I'm using a digital source to research, I'm researching. I'm not reading for pleasure or because I'm using, like you said, the indexing and the ability to search the, excuse me, the internet. And like on my iPad, now Android probably can't do this because they're way behind, but on an iPad you can have multiple things open. and <laughs> You can do it on Android. I've had Android. Oh, it just probably freezes a lot. And so anyway, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just taking cheap shots at our at our tech guy because he our don't bot. have a mic. So. <laughs> <laughs> he's frozen because he's Android. So anyway. He's um, buffering over yeah, there. Yeah, he's buffering. He's a little buffering. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll have multiple multiple apps open on my iPad. I'll be going back and forth. But there is something about <coughs> when you pick up a book and when you open a notebook, you are doing something that is very hard for our world to do and that is concentrating it takes discipline to open a book and to sit because when you open a book you are committing to one idea or subject 
for however long you're going to read that book. So that's why I sincerely try when I walk into the house of God, especially into the sanctuary, I don't always do this, but for the most part, unless I have information that I need digitally, especially if I'm not preaching, I shut my phone off. I pick up a Bible and a notebook with a pen or, or several pens because I like to do different colors in my notes. And that's what I walk into the house of God with because I'm setting the time aside. I'm saying, okay, for the duration of this service, I have a notebook which says I fully expect God to speak to me and I'm going to write down whatever he says. And I have one book and that is the Bible. I'm dedicating this time to this book because we all do it. You pick up your phone and the the man of God or, or the preacher, male or female, says turn to Leviticus and you get your Bible app open and then your whatever news deal or social media is like, ding, so-and-so started a live feed. And then you're not thinking about Leviticus at all. You're thinking about so-and-so that started a live feed and you're thinking about the 17 emails that you just got notifications on and you got three text messages. And by the time you get back to Leviticus, they're already through it and you don't even, you have no idea where they even took their text from. That is really good, Mitchell. My personal studies with the Bible, and let me tell you why. They have discovered, there's a good book if you're a reader. It's a great book on what the screen does to your brain. It's called The Shallows. It's an older book. It was written in like 2007 or eight, but it's still relevant. Uh, truth is eternal. It's not, tr truth doesn't have to f trend and it's not fashionable. It's eternal. <clears throat> and uh, they've discovered that uh, in fact, any more, even the images that you see in videos and stuff, they don't last very long. Uh, when they first started an image, if it lasted a minute, that was, they considered that short. But now an image, even on a video, in a movie, m many times will last less than one second. Sometimes mostly 25th of a second. Because the human mind is so fragmented because of all of the screen and the moving of it that it cannot concentrate more than one twenty-fifth of a second. Now, that's where the ADD and the ADHD sicknesses have come from. They are discovering. They also know that when you're, when you're on that, that your brain does not go to the higher hemispheres, but it relegates in the lower hemispheres of appetites and and desires and so it where your critical thinking occurs is in the highest in the abstract area of the hemisphere of the brain it's where your great ideas come from it's where powerful thinking comes from uh, most of your great thinkers to this day relegate a little time to that part of their life and they relegate major portions of their time to concentration if you learn how the brain concentrates, it's revolutionary. It revolves. You have a thought that comes into your mind. The old thinker used to think if you could concentrate on one subject for two minutes, you were the most brilliant person that ever lived. Now that sounds easy, but you try it. You try to concentrate on one subject without your brain being distracted and you thinking of something else. And it's I've never been able to do it. It's virtually impossible. And uh, because that's your, your brain will throw it out, becomes distracted. And concentration is when you have the ability to reach out and grab that and pull it back in and think about it again and keep bringing it back. That's why the Bible says to gird up the loins of your mind, to bring them in. And so uh, there's ways to do that, Brother Mitchell. I can't retain as well off of a screen. I learned this when I was doing my master's degree. I could not retain the stuff. I was reading so much. I don't know. I don't know how many books I read, and how many. I've got six hundred pages that I I wrote during that three three years of my master's. And so, 
uh, for me to retain, I have to go back to the pages. I can't watch the light on the screen. My my mind doesn't grasp it like it does off the pages. Now that's me. I'm not going to put everybody in that category. So I think there's a room for both the technology. I know when I'm traveling, I, I, I'm like the evangelist. I love to carry my iPad because I have so many resources and I don't have to take five suitcases. But I have a huge library in here that I love to spread those books out and just read and make notes. And well, and I think that's part of why there is a, I've noticed that there is a, uh, I don't know that it's a trend, but it is a trend. Um, I just don't know if that's the right word, but it is an acceptable word. There is a trend amongst a lot of ministers that I'm blessed fellowship with that they are either have never left paper notes, if it's at all possible, or if they are going back to as close to paper notes as they can. Um, whether that be buying tablets that are basically modern notebooks, um, or whether it be programs, applications on iPads, or I'm, they might have one or two for Samsung out there that you can actually write. I, my Our attorney uh, has a notebook, a pad, and a pen. Looks like a notebook. And he, and he and she writes on that, and then it automatically transfers to email. It's an amazing deal. I don't know where they come from. It's not an iPad. The one that I've looked at for a while, and, and I might buy one. I don't know. I'm still doing a lot of research. It's called Remarkable. The Remarkable 2 is it's pretty cool. Um, and it's basically a notebook that, that stores all your documents, etc. I know of one man of God who that's pretty much all he uses now when he preaches. And I've asked him about it, and he, he just says it's because he enjoys writing his notes. But I think I print out pretty much all of my notes because I can find them easier by turning pages than I can on my iPad. Yeah. And I, did, I don't have it here. I have a beautiful notebook that Brother Bob made me. By the way, let me advertise all of you preachers that are listening. I've got a black uh, ostrich skin notebook, three three binder, three ring, ring binder, three ring binder that Brother Bob made. It's just beautiful if you guys are into any of that. He's a phenomenal leather guy. And that it matches my leather. I've got a premier study Bible that's been rebound in ostrich. Complimentary thank you to my best friend Rick Mayo who bought that for me as a gift. Uh, Pastor Mayo. But uh, one, of, uh, one of my greatest friends. But anyway, uh, I love to preach out of notes. And I love, because I can go back in and while I'm studying, I'll just scribble in. You can just write on. Write more stuff. And I know you can do that with those notepads, too. That's just, I didn't grow up in that era. Exactly. So I, I don't know how to do it. Well, and I think one thing <coughs> that does show up, and preachers, anybody who's preached, even a handful of times will notice this, is what technology, and it is a powerful tool, and I'm not not just lashing out against it but one thing that it has done it is it severely handicapped people's ability to pay attention and if you are not splitting the atom as brother urshan says in the word of god you will lose people yeah almost instantly and the other thing is because we because technology is constantly moving and it's constantly changing and we don't have the ability to concentrate. And we've kind of lost the ability to read uh, text. I don't just mean read like writing, but read texts like Shakespeare, something along those lines. Because technology has kind of moved us away from that. When a preacher reads out of the King James Version, people find it very difficult to follow along with that. And it's because they... It we have to. Well, the King James was written. Read it. 
the King James was written at, as I remember right, it's like the first year of college English. Most people read, anymore, most people read at a sixth grade level in America. That's sad to say. They say that by the year of 2030, that's not very far off, that most kids won't know how to write and many of them won't know how to read. And I believe that, especially if these liberals keep getting in the office. And uh, I'm not being political. I'm just saying that it's just everything has become imagery. And uh, it's, it's the dark ages. It, you were going back to the dark ages. Yep. One good message to listen about that <clears throat> is uh, Brother Booker's message. Um, barbarism in the 21st yes, century. Yeah. The 21st century. Yeah, and that's that's quite a few years old, and he he was just a prophet. Yeah. I, I know where he preached that and was not well taken. That's a funny story. You have to ask me after this. But anyway, well, it's an incredible that, story. We're going to record that story and put it behind a paywall. <laughs> <laughs> and brother booker if you're hearing this we'll give you half <laughs> just reach out to us <laughs> um i think it's it's a blessing and a curse it's a tool yeah it's a tool there's there's books that are complete garbage that you can sit down and dedicate the time to complete garbage and it's a book um like i said i use all forms of technology that are at my fingertips when i'm researching when i'm studying um, when I'm trying to, one of the biggest forms of technology that I use is the Amazon app to buy the books that I want. Um, and without technology, you couldn't do that. Finding those books has become immensely easier because of technology. It's not a, I don't think that it's, you take one or the other. I think it's just understanding that there are pros and cons to both. But I do think that it would benefit every person listening to this to dedicate time to pick up a book, especially the Bible, a physical Bible, and sit down with it, especially in the house of God. Because when you do that, like I said, you are making a dedication of time to one idea. That's totally foreign to the world we live in. Because we have... we're. We're basically walking cyborgs already because you got a smartwatch on and you got a phone in your pocket. And without either of those, people, honestly, most of us couldn't function. So we're already kind of a hybrid of technology and humanity. I don't know how you feel about that, but that's kind of where we're at. And so when you remove all of that from you and you pick up the word of God, you are telling God by your action, okay, for this amount of time, the one thing I will think about is this book. Civilization is really a series and a system of other people doing stuff for you and creating systems that do stuff for you. You don't have to go make a hamburger. You just go buy it. Yeah, And it, it can be very elementary in the sense that you buy packaged hamburger and you bring it home and you fry it. Or you can just go through a drive-thru and get one. You really don't even have to do algebraic figures anymore. You know, they did some of the greatest figures in the world on an abacus. But I don't even know how to use an abacus, you know. I don't have to, don't need to. It's a waste of my time unless civilization is destroyed yeah you know so uh <clears throat> there has to be and i pray that it's not but i want the word of god in my heart i don't want everybody else doing it for me david said thy word have i hid in my heart that i might not sin against thee and which which minor prophet was it that made the statement that in, in the last days there would be a famine, not of the Word of God, but of hearing the Word of God. Was that Hosea? I believe it was in Hosea that that, yes. that prophet made no, that. Amos. Was it Amos? 
that made that statement. And uh, I knew it was either Amos or Andy. No. <laughs> One of no, the greatest, <laughs> one of the greatest. It was a funny of all time, but a uh, uh, little humor there. <laughs> but it's not humorous that we have more of the Word of God than we've ever had in our life. Most of the people that hear that have no have, idea. I know who that's Amos why I said it. Is. I know that's why I said it. <laughs> My favorite character is Shorty. <laughs> <laughs> the but uh, <laughs> um. That's the, probably not politically correct. It's not anymore. <laughs> I don't care. It's still the greatest comedy of all time. It's not. But you know what? Who gives a rip Bishop, about Today me? I was listening. It was a fictional book, which that's one thing that I wanted to point out is most fictional books that I read or listen to or whatever. Well, not read, but I listen to them because I don't have time to sit down and just read a fictional book. I have too many other good things to read about but i'll listen to fictional books but there was a really good statement in there and he was talking about the main character was in a meeting and this guy was rambling on and on and on and he said that he liked to think about what he was going to say because words are some of the greatest resource that anybody has and he said i think that everyone should have an allotment of words in their lifetime. And he said, and all the people that just ramble on and on and on forever and ever and just say all this ignorant stuff, by the time they get to the end of their life, they don't have very many words left to say. So all of us that have sustenance to our conversation can actually speak up. And that pointed something out to me that that, that is true. The Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. And that's one of the greatest resources you can have. And it, another analogy would be whatever you ingest eventually will out. So what you were saying, it's our responsibility to inform ourselves. And if we're informing ourselves with trash... And junk and just everything, all the vast amounts of information. We are at a place right now that literally you cannot, you cannot ingest all of the information that's in the world right now. It's physically impossible. Yeah. And if you are ingesting junk all the time, then that's what's going to come out. And the greatest resource that you have, your words, one of the greatest resources that you have, your words, is just going to be filled with that trash. So whether it's on paper, whether it's digital, you know, that's all personal preference. But the key is you've got to be ingesting something that's of sustenance, something that's of of true value to the world around you. Make an interesting statement. This has nothing to do with whether it's technology or scriptural word, but the Bible talks about that the priest every evening had to take out the trash. They would literally carry the ashes outside of the camp. And the writer of Hebrews, which I believe was the Apostle Paul, he talks about taking those ashes outside of the camp. Years ago, I need to bring this out of mothballs. I preached a message called Garbage In and Garbage Out. And you would not believe the engineering that it takes to eliminate trash and waste out of a city. There are men and women that make millions of dollars. And even when you go when you go to Jerusalem, I hope you boys can go in November. I'd love it if you could. With mom and I, Lord willing, when we go to Israel. Most of the time when we enter into Jerusalem, the tourist gate is the garbage gate. That's funny. <laughs> I don't think that's on accident. <laughs> 
But in oh my. D- even during seizes, when they were under siege and and stuff, uh, they had to have a way to eliminate the waste, yeah. the garbage. And in our life, we get to choose what's important to us. You made a statement. Being politically correct is not important to me. I just throw that out the garbage gate. Yeah. I don't I don't want to be rude or crass or or you know in, insinuating but I refuse to let this corrupted perverted society tell me what's evil. Yep. Tell me what's good. Tell me what's political correct. Brother Urshan just did a podcast I believe the gentleman's name, he's a pastor in Dallas, his brother Pollock, I believe was the gentleman that he did podcast with. He made it, they start out by talking about the scripture that says, let your speech be always with grace. And then it says seasoned, seasoned with salt. salt. And they talk about how some people have it backwards. Their speech is always with salt, seasoned with grace. But he talks about how our speech should extend grace but there's an edge to salt and sometimes it's necessary. One thing that we forget <clears throat> knowledge is weight. It is. Knowledge like for instance some people I've heard make the statement that knowledge is power and it's very lightweight. I don't believe that. I believe knowledge is power, but there's a weight. For instance, there's a price you pay for revelation. When you want the deep things of the Word of God, you have to dig deep. That takes time and it takes consecration. If you want to know all the inside scoop of all the gossip, you got to dig. I mean, I think it's a complete waste of time, but you have to pay a price for that. Um, I believe this is this is off topic, but I believe that's why the Bible is so against gossip, because, for instance. If you're talking about someone to someone else, even if it's true, you're dumping weight that is unnecessary into that person's life. So if if I'm telling you, well, brother so-and-so did such and such, now I've just dumped a bunch of weight into your life that's unnecessary. You don't need to know all that about brother or sister so-and-so. It's irrelevant. But with what we read, with what we the Apostle Paul yeah, said... I think it's really relevant, Mitch. I don't mean to interrupt you. No, you're okay. It's, that's what the Apostle Paul said when he said, laying aside every weight yeah. and the sin. And then another place, what Apostle said, laying aside all malice. You lay aside... There's lots of laying aside. Yeah. It, 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 we're not off subject. Take the garbage out. Take the garbage out. We we have we choose whether it's on this here or whether and you you, you guys know this because I've always taught this because I knew there's a day coming. You know, people say, "What's the difference between Netflix and PureFlix and all of this?" It's content. Content is always the issue with God. Yeah, always. I don't care if it's in a magazine. I don't care if it's on a talk radio program. There were times I turned Rush Limbaugh off. Yeah. He made me so mad. He wasn't cussing, but he, the way he disregarded authority infuriated me. And I believe, and so much of what he said, I loved. As far as the, the American, I love America. We're going to do a whole podcast how... I'm not going to quit being American just because I'm apostolic. I don't care how many of these apostolics go in their chicken hole and hide in their chicken hole and they don't say nothing. I'm not going there. I'm an American. I thank God I live here in America. I I, I have freedoms that this world can only dream about. Yep. And I'm not going in my chicken hole with you. You can go in there and you can say that's a Holy Ghost all you want to. I'll tell you what that is. You're just being a chicken. And I'm not backing up from that. I don't care what your name is. Uh, there's there's things that if we lose here in America, it's going to affect the church worldwide. And, and, and I think it's our responsibility. If God has given us that kind of power, then we need to hang on to it and use it for his kingdom and for his glory. And 
And so, I don't know how I got off on that, but anyway. Content. Content is massive. What we allow in our minds, in our spirit, and our conversations. I've eliminated slang words and words that caused hurt in other people's lives years ago. Yeah. Before it became popular, I eliminated racially identification words because I don't want to hurt a brother or sister. Right. Uh, But I'm not. It's not about being woke. It's about being a Christian. It's about being a Christian, and it's about being who God called us to be. And uh, even when I disagree with people, let me use one. In the homosexual, gay and lesbian, gender lifestyle, I am in total opposition to that lifestyle, but I'm not calling them names. I love them. Right. They're my brother and my sister. I pray that God will heal their mind. Pray that God will show them the the wonderful people they really are, because He created them. They they've just been so deceived by by Satan and evil spirits, you know. And that's just one instance. And I don't want to get bogged down there, but we're talking about the Word of God and content. And I'm not filling my life full of a bunch of trash. But as you accumulate off of technology, like you said, Mitchell. Trash comes in, so you got to have a way to eliminate that trash. And to me, the way you eliminate that trash is through praying in the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. The Bible says that His that he, they were the Word of God. They were renewed by the Word of God. They were cleansed. Uh, what I can't remember is, is it Peter that said, "By the washing of the Word." And so there is a purification process and i bring that up because i you know if you're listening to somebody and they say something that's messed up and we're all we're not perfect we're going to say stuff that's that we sh- probably shouldn't have said uh best thing to do is own up to it and say okay help me out lord not to say that again or yep. whatever uh nobody's perfect It's not what we're looking for, but we're looking for ways in these mediums. All of these are mediums, whether it's a book, a leather book, or if you're reading a book. um, I have pop-ups on my newscast, you know, that are stupid. Yeah. That's a Greek word for, uh, I didn't want to see it. (laughs) That's a Greek word that means stupid. Oh, mom, don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> Mama don't like us to use that word but for her obtuse, obtuse baby doll. <laughs> well, and, and one scripture that hit me this last Tuesday night while you were preaching was, you said, make no provision. You quoted the scripture, make no provision for the flesh. So it doesn't matter what medium it is. If it's making provision for the flesh, get it out. If you're listening to a book and it goes somewhere that shouldn't go, delete it. You know, or, you or know, reading a book. Or reading a book. Don't, don't, don't allow your mind to go there. And you know, it. If you're on, I, I did this the other night. I went through my Instagram following, and I just got so mad. I said, if if it's anything that I just slightly disagree with. Even if it's just somebody saying something I don't agree with, I'm just going to unfollow them because I don't want that weight in my life. Yeah. I just want to, you know, I just want to get on there and enjoy it. Not be like, oh, why'd they say that? You know? Well, and that's the, like, for instance, the past, for a long time now, I refuse to follow the news beyond, there's beyond one, Trump. <laughs> oh, okay. Beyond one thing that I listen to in the, I listen to one podcast in the morning for about fifteen minutes, which covers they'll cover three or four major topics globally, and that's it. The reason why I refuse to do that is because I used to be this way. Now I find it humorous. You find people walking into the house of God that have spent so much time in the news; they're mad at everybody. Yeah. Nobody did anything to them. 
They just don't like what they see in the news. And they come in to the house of God or other places, other places of business or worship, etc. And they come in guns blazing. And it's not because they're mad at you. It's because they're mad because they don't, they haven't allowed, because the Holy Ghost is telling them this. Because he's told me this. And he'll talk to them the same way. They're not listening to God saying, shut it off. Shut it off. They're not catching the signals that are saying, this is too much. That's that's why I issued the challenge of of picking up the Bible. When you pick up the Bible physically, you are accepting the challenge that I'm going to read this thing without interruption. See how long you can do it. Well, David said, I have esteemed thy word above my necessary food. Sometimes I binge on donuts. I shouldn't. It's not right. Especially Schuster's maple cinnamon rolls. Uh, I just, uh, I'm not supposed to. The doctor told me not to. And it's not very often. I won't go in a Krispy Kreme when they're making fresh hot donuts because I'll eat a dozen so fast. I can eat a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. I'll pay for it for two days after that. But, uh, uh, I have binged on them before. Well, I think if we would binge on the Word of God yeah. and starve on all this other stuff in the world, that it would be so much better for us. And uh, and that's really what this podcast is about, whether you use uh, a regular Bible or whether you use an iPhone or an iPod or an Android. Yeah. Or a computer. Just before I had an iPhone or an iPad, I spent hours on a computer digging out stuff in the Word of God late at night in the old house when that computer was in the living room. You guys knew where it was. We always keep our computer. I wish we could do that with our phones now in a place where everybody's accountable with what they're looking at, what they're reading listening to and uh that's really what this is all about is to challenge you to get the garbage out of your life and get the word of god in your life engineer a way that you eliminate the garbage out of your life even when you're reading stuff you don't have to agree with everything that you read challenge it with the word of god yeah that's what i got a green pen for Cross yeah. it out with green pen and start writing Bible next to it. Yes. Um, so uh, that's really what I think is the important thing. And if you need to be sensitive, and if you're going to preach for somebody that don't like iPads, then carry a Bible carry with a Bible. you. In closing, uh, Bishop, you know, a lot of young people are like, well, where, where do I start? How do I? I remember being a young person. And I would hear men of God just, I mean, just quote the Bible, you know. And as a young person, you think that's like, you think that that's like, you know, eight and a half hours a day of reading the Bible. And it may be, it may be for some men of God. But I would say for the vast majority, it's not eight and a half hours of reading the Bible. It's consistently reading the Bible every day. I heard Brother Urshan talking about this uh, last Tuesday night. I was getting ready for church and he was preaching about, you know, how people, you know, beginning of the year, everybody's at the gym. And he told a story how one time he got upset with himself because he had gotten a little overweight or whatever. I don't know how that's possible for him, but anyway. He got a little overweight. He said, well, I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow, and I'm going to be there for two and a half hours. Did squats and sit-ups and pull-ups, and said the next day couldn't even walk. He's like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and he talked about how that really did nothing because it wasn't the two and a half hours, the one day. It was the consistency of a lifestyle. And that's how the Word of God and prayer should be. And one thing that helped me when I was a lot younger was with both prayer and the Word of God, 
I started with five minutes, five minutes of, of that. And it created an appetite to where five minutes was not enough. Then it had, to, you know, it just became lifestyle. And then, you know, now there's times when you're preaching and it just seems like it just starts coming out. And it's the consistency of a lifestyle. So start with something small. I, I've told the young people in this church, if it's one verse a day, if you only read one verse a day, that's better than, than zero verses a day that you did the day before. I started out with three of the five cards. They used to call them index cards. And I, early in the morning, I would write three scriptures on that card every day. Yeah. And by the end of the day, I'd put that card in my pocket. And school, lunch, wherever, at the end of the day, I had those three verses memorized. Now, this is a total different subject than what we start with, but we're talking about getting the Word of God in our life. And uh, and then that graduated when I started writing out sermons. I would not just write the reference. I would write the whole Scripture out, which seems in my life, if I write that Scripture out, it boy, it sticks in my mind. Yeah. You know? And I listen to the Bible every day. Oh, yeah. One, that's why in closing I want to read the Scripture because... Whether it's technology, whether it's paper, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 119 and 11. Yes, sir. When you get that word in your heart, there it, it's a combatant against sin. It is. So we want to thank you for being with us tonight. Don't forget, stop by the Double Portion Instagram page for now if you're interested in merch. Jump on the Double Portion Instagram page and message us. Give us a personal message and we will get merchandise to you. We are right now working on setting up a store. It may be a little while. We, we've got to see how it plays out. But we'll talk to our our bot friend and see what he can do for us. Uh, now we'll thank Brother Jordan for all of his hard work. And we will have a store set up. But as of right now, we've got limited amount of merch. So we want to see how popular it is. Message us, and we'll see you on the next one. God bless.